in applications uh, into big markets like China? Um, Sam Gerb, the founder mentioned partner of Antiva Ventures. We do early stage investment into fintech, data AI, and also crypto, but not, not so much tokens, more into blockchain and investing in the guys that are creating the, the infrastructure for the crypto economy. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Dibb. Uh, I run Astronaut Capital. We're a long, short crypto hedge fund. Uh, in addition to that, I run two research companies um, dedicated to cryptocurrency. That's Bitcoin Research and STORating.com. So at the end of last year, I think the prediction was that secure, it'll be a wave of security tokens in 2019, you know, tokenizing a whole range of asset classes from you know, diamonds, art, wine, all, all sorts of illiquid things. And I think the experience to date hasn't been quite that. It hasn't been, I don't think we've seen the wave of security tokens that was predicted. What do you guys think about you know the future of security tokens and, and the role of digital assets? What do you think they add to the status quo? I'll start off. Um, I mean, look, I think we're we're very early still. Um, people are still trying to get their heads around the whole utility token saga and what's happening with major cryptocurrencies. Obviously, there's things like regulation that have has been slowing uh, the progress of security tokens down. Um, and then we've got other issues such as liquidity and exchanges as well, which is uh, turning out to be a lot harder than, than previously with, with other cryptocurrencies. So um, I think that a lot of good intentions and great ideas are out there that are going to uh, obviously revolutionize the, the financial sector in particular. And uh, you know, we are making a lot of progress. However, it is taking some time. Um, the sectors that we see for disruption, uh, particularly for security tokens, is uh, number one, real assets, um, being uh, property uh, artwork, as you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> we see uh, a point of disruption there for, for security tokens, most certainly. I'm going to take another side to that, because for me, I mean, the 24-7 market's fractionality, I don't know if that adds a massive amount of value, because if an investor is going to be taking on a new asset, it has to be so much better than the existing solutions. I don't really think that's so for the, you know, if we're talking about just real assets. But if we're talking about something a little bit more esoteric, like if we're talking about water rights or <laughs> digital rights management, digital assets, I think that's super interesting. Or maybe maybe it's something more abstract, like non-performing loans that get rolled up into security tokens, and that's where we see the, the waterfall coming from. I think the market's been really focused on property because it's the biggest market to go out there and tackle. But I almost think that it's gonna come from some kind of niche and that's that's where we're gonna see that whole the mindset, the whole shift and the change to security tokens. I think it's it's inevitable that yes, everything will be digital, digitally managed. Uh, it's just a question of when. A good analogy I normally use is um, the children outside. They're playing with a lot of things outside with, um, with, with new technology and new ideas coming in, but the parents are not saying anything. So the parents I'm talking about like regulators, like the government, uh, they're not doing enough, they're not pushing it enough because there's a lot of things at stake. So one of the major things I'm seeing around the world is um, as long as the government is supportive and actually doing something, then it's something that uh, we can see it flies much more quicker because if we're just outside talking and trying to do something, uh, but not to a bigger scale, then the security tokens will be just like another game token or another video game that we're all playing. So, um, so that's one of the trends I'm looking at. I'm still very positive in terms of how it is because um, we are actually doing something in China. So it's a little bit odd, but then again, most people don't know about that. So can I ask next, what, what is the purpose? What do you think the purpose is of security tokens and utility tokens and, and why do we have these? Why do they exist? <laughs> well, if, if we're old enough, uh, remember a few years ago when people were starting to talk about tokens and blockchain and everything, and uh, someone thought, hey, we could actually sell these tokens. And uh, initially, remember that they started off as security tokens first. But then again, they say, hey, we're just afraid of getting going to jail because the SEC and the regulators, the government will be catching us and just kicking us into jail. So, well, let's 
change it to a non-name called utility token. But from there on, well, it's been a mess because um, the, the difference between a utility token and a security token is that fundamentally, if you're using this for speculation and for actual investment of funding, a utility token is not the right way to go. Well, an example is if you're using this on a daily basis for an actual application or inside your operations, well, people will be hoarding it, the tokens, if it speculates pretty good and then selling it off. Uh, one of the best examples that like I can quote right now is remember Telegram? Yeah, um, it, they've got problems with the ICOs. Last, last year, early last year, right? When people were talking about, hey, let's speculate this and then, hey, let's sell it off early. So they just announced that, hey, they're gonna have a, a public sale, limited public sale. So it's been quite a mess in terms of utility token stuff. Security tokens, if it's, goes well, then it is a way, uh, a good way as a VC ourselves, we'll look at it as a, another alternative method of fundraising, which I do try to support. Uh, but of course it has to be regulated in certain ways. If I suffer utility tokens, let's say it helps to bootstrap the network a bit, that's, that's great. Uh, if you're creating a new protocol and you need to get users on board and get that critical mass to make it worth something, then yeah, utility tokens are worthwhile, security tokens. I don't, I don't, like as I, as I was mentioning before, I don't really think we've seen a killer application there for security tokens. Um, although we do have the protocols and the mechanics in place, I'd say the thing that we're really lacking at the moment is the, the regulatory guidance to allow people to create the right kinds of security tokens. Um, and just, I, I don't know where the, the, the driver's gonna come from for that. I think the, the lines between uh, utility tokens and security tokens are actually quite blurred. Um, you take, for example, probably one of the best performing, performing utility tokens, which would be Binance BNB. Um, that is a security token, effectively. They, they implement a buy and burn feature where the more revenue that's generated by Binance, um, the higher the price will go because they're burning the token. So, in effect, um, it's a lot of these utility tokens that we see, particularly the very good performing ones, actually have um, a lot of the same aspects as security tokens. Um, so, I mean, now we're seeing applications of utility tokens that are doing well, as you said, network effects. That's, that's obviously one of the, the big drivers for it. Um, but as for security tokens, we're not really seeing that uptake yet. Um, I think it's, it's working in a, in a different dynamic completely. So in, out of the relatively small ecosystem of security tokens that have been released or developed, what, what are your views on what do you think is the most interesting of those? Um, as I mentioned before, I mean, we, we are seeing a lot in the property sector, um, you know, fractionalizing assets, physical assets and property. Uh, we see that as quite interesting. Um, funds management, venture capital firms, um, that, that's also quite a bit of a trend now. Um, what I would like to see, what would be really cool, is the tokenization of existing, uh, for example, uh, venture capital firms, like let's say Sequoia. Um, if they were to tokenize an existing fund um, and provide liquidity for that to basically anybody that wants to buy in the secondary market, I think there's huge applications for those types of assets. Um, another part that I'd probably distinguish is also um, talking about security tokens, and then obviously there's tokenized securities, two different things. Tokenized securities more so focusing on tokenizing Apple shares or existing traditional financial products. Uh, so we, we see a lot of room for that to grow, albeit they're very, very different. Um, and we're also already starting to see some firms come up with applications for those. When we talk about security tokens and what, what's happening in that space, I mean, there's been over or somewhere around say 100 security tokens that, that I know that have been created, only a couple of which have been listed. The things that I'm thinking about at the moment are more so around the liquidity that happens in the secondary market. And even if we were to say, yeah, let's, let's tokenize existing assets or let's tokenize an existing fund, then my, my, my real concern is we don't actually have the liquidity in the secondary market and investors have a really poor experience. So 
we look at any kind of fund that has been securitized previously, typically if they're listed, they'll trade at like a 10, 20% discount. To me, that makes a bit of sense because we're just uh, mortising up the, the management fee into perpetuity. Uh, so what, security tokens were preferred as a funding venue when there was a lot of hype in crypto and people were like, yeah, I'm getting more bang for my buck. This is exotic, this is sexy, this is something I want to be a part of. Now that hype has died down, I think even more so, even though we've come out of the kind of crypto bear market because all of the, the trash has been washed away. So now we're seeing things really being built and what I'd like to see is where's that, where's that liquidity going to come from in the secondary market and then we're going to have we're going to have some really interesting innovations in the, the security token space. Like I mentioned, I think that's going to be more around digital rights management, digital yeah, digital assets, because if you look at it at the moment, if someone wants to buy or sell rights for a movie, they might have to negotiate with the, the owners of the, uh, the, 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 the script, the music, the publishing rights, they might have different geographic rights, that is all very difficult to manage at the moment and sometimes they don't even have the records of who holds those rights or where that person can be contacted. But if that was all managed through smart contracts on blockchain, it all becomes a lot easier, a lot a lot less friction. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, one of the <clears throat> real life applications of an SDO is exactly what we're doing in China right now in Shenzhen. So there's an official exchange. Uh, it's been there for nearly three years right now. And just last year, November, we just announced that it's blockchain driven. So basically, we're talking about an STO, uh, but we don't call it an STO in China. So what it is, is basically um, the, the token itself or the stock code itself is tied to actual assets. So you have to have a certain scale in terms of the operations in order to work on that. And some of the examples are um, cultural assets. We're talking about things that are hard to evaluate uh, in terms of like uh, art uh, property is something that we're looking into and we're actually pushing it up. Uh, there are companies that are selling uh, tickets um, to, to uh, different tourist spots in China. So they have a scale. So one of the biggest things that why China could do this is because they have a big uh, secondary market. We're talking about people, normal people buying and selling. So we are actually doing that. And that's one real life applications which I don't see happening in anywhere around the world yet. So a couple of you have mentioned uh, regulation and legal uncertainty, and it's certainly a topic that was um, covered quite a bit yesterday in some of the panels. Uh, from a business perspective for you guys, you know, what do you, uh, how, how big an impediment, I guess, do you think the regulatory framework or the lack of regulatory certainty is? And you know, do you have any, is anyone willing to, to take a punt on um, how you think regulators are going to, or how successful they will be in balancing, I guess, the, the uh, protection of interests of participants and you know, encouraging and allowing innovation? Well, on a PR side, on a surface value, a lot of the regulators say they're very innovative. So, but that's talk. Uh, so one of the, the biggest issues is in terms of how, well, blockchain, crypto, and STOs are moving along is like I mentioned that regulators must, the parents must be saying something and pushing it forward. Uh, because in essence, an STO it has to be uh, regulated in a certain way. So do you want to be regulated by a 20 year old or do you want to be regulated by certain regulators or official regulators outside? And one of the things I'm seeing right now outside in the, the world, the governments are not sure um, we are not sure as well in terms of how it should be done. So there's a lot of um, question marks coming along and the regulators and the, the banks and everyone, they, they're they looking at it already. It's just a matter of, hey, are there any actual real life applications outside? So why could China do this? Well, China is not a democracy, period. So I've been working with some of the banks, biggest banks in the world last year, uh, HSBC, Intesa Santana, Santander and everyone. 
Um, and when they come over to China and they say, hey, what's happening in China? And they say, hey, can we do this in England? Can we do this in France or Spain? I say, until you do not have a democracy, yes, because look at what's happening in Europe, in England. So you want to do something, you have to go through parliament, you have to go through everything. So there are certain uh, political parties with political agendas and say, hey, this is something that we don't want it, we don't want this to happen. Um, take a few hours ago, which I just saw a news report in terms of um, how US lawmakers are saying no to Facebook. So we were, we were talking about um, Facebook having their, their tokens, Libra coming out, but then again, a few hours ago, the, the lawmakers are saying no, you have to come to Congress and you have to discuss this over Congress. So, so the regulators in a way are scared, but they want to be looked at as seen as being innovative. So it's a dilemma. Yeah, I'm just going to build on that, but I'm going to look at it. I've had this conversation with a couple of people here uh, yesterday, but look at what's happening in the US versus Singapore, Hong Kong, of less awareness about what's going on in China and then also what's going on in the UK too. The problem that we, we're facing is the existing regulations don't suit digital assets in some jurisdictions. In the UK, this is less of an issue, so we can see some evolution happening over there. US doesn't really work. We've also seen some pushback, as Desmond mentioned, from uh, lawmakers around Facebook's uh, Project Libra. In Singapore, the regulators actually been quite embracing of what's happening. Uh, they haven't really put any regulations around security tokens. They're kind of trying to use the existing framework that they have there. But what they'll likely do is they'll wait and see, see what works, see what works in other jurisdictions, work with the people who are actually building out the ecosystem and then create the regulations around that. Uh, Hong Kong, I'd say, getting a similar approach here too. So that combined with what Desmond was saying is happening in China. Yeah, I think the future, the future of the development is really going to happen in Asia. And if anything, with what Facebook's working on, I think that's going to be a positive for the industry generally because now you have a unified body with a lot of vested corporate interests who have the firepower to go and change public policy. So they could actually create a unified regulatory framework that could allow us to have globalized security token issuance, which, which in itself, that could be a killer application. But you need to have someone who's willing to put down the time, the effort, the money to get everyone on board. And I don't think you're gonna see, see that coming from any one particular government. Yeah, I don't have too much to add there. I think um, we're based in Singapore and, and we've got quite a close relationship with MAS there. They are very progressive with what they're doing. Um, and, and it's quite surprising. I mean, at the moment, they are sandboxing two uh, exchanges for security tokens. Um, so, you know, we, we expect that to happen, albeit really, really slow. Um, they take their time with this sort of stuff um, and, and they're not rushing. We're seeing a lot of progress being made in Thailand uh, as well for, for security token exchanges. Philippines with their special economic zone um, has, uh, I think, just over 10 exchanges in, in the making. So that's all happening. In terms of actual offering of these uh, security tokens, we're finding um, from our side that people are still leaning towards incorporation and domiciling in offshore jurisdictions, uh, BVI, Cayman Islands, etc. because there's just simply no clarity in um, some of these major jurisdictions in, in Asia and, and obviously the US. Um, yeah, that's what I've got there. I think another topic that was covered yesterday was um, the, the fact that so far, not a lot of the big institutions have really embraced tokenization of digital assets. From an investor perspective, what do you think needs to change in the ecosystem in order for institutional investors to really buy in and, and start participating in digital assets? I think, uh, as the other guys mentioned, liquidity's gotta be one of the biggest concerns. And it's not just on an institutional level, but it's on a uh, retail uh, level as well. Um, surveys that, that we've done and others have indicated that liquidity is the pretty much the only component that is stopping people from actually investing in security tokens. Now, it's not like a utility token where you can sign up on a you know, Binance account with no KYC and start trading. We're talking about a very sophisticated product that you have to be KYC. Most of the time, you'll have to be an accredited investor. 
So this liquidity causes probably one of the larger issues. What's the point of uh, having a security token on exchange if nobody's trading it? Uh, so from an institutional level, what we are seeing is more so the tokenization of existing financial products and securities, bonds being one of them. Um, but are we seeing participation into actual security token offerings? Um, not exactly, not, not to, to uh, what I know. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that too. I just say it is, it is liquidity. But then also, like Softchains use security tokens for 100 million euro bond issuance. So some of the big players are looking at it. I don't really think they have the level of expertise to deal with it at the moment. I'd say the conversations that are generally going around would be around why, why, why do we need this at the moment? Is this actually something that's different? Does it add any value to the underlying business or is this just novelty? And we're probably going through that novelty phase and people are starting to realize what the benefits are there. I mean, personally, I've been trying to do a, do a secondary share transfer private company over in the UK. It's taken, it took 20 days, then the tax authority said, well, we don't, we don't actually know where the stamp duty's gone. You have to give us another 20 days to work this out. It's probably gonna take about three months to, to get this resolved. I mean, that's, that's pretty onerous. Um, Whereas with the Tonic Swaps blockchain, you can solve all this stuff relatively quickly. So I think institutions like government institutions and large institutions are starting to cotton on that there is a use case here. But yeah, as Mel was saying, it's it's liquidity that's really holding it up. And I do agree with the two speakers around here as well. Uh, liquidity, it's, it's for us, e e even for everyone, if you're buying crypto, how do you buy crypto right now? So what do you put, what kind of exchange are you using? Um, and there are a lot of big exchanges outside which have flaws as well. Uh, cybersecurity, they've been hacked on a daily basis. Um, recently there's, there's one in, in Hong Kong, Gatecoin, that just crashed uh, because of operational issues around here. Uh, I'm one of the victims. So it's, it's pretty difficult in terms of how, how normal people, your mom and dad, buys crypto and then selling off crypto or having a place to, to hold the crypto. So in, in terms of until that happens, uh, I don't think that um, there will be a lot of big adoptions coming along here, and which means that there's no urgency for the regulators to push it forward. So I hope there's a little bit more push. Uh, and what we're looking at is definitely in terms of how uh, blockchain applications in real life should be first, and then from there on push it you know, to more of a consumer level. So to finish up the panel, can I ask um, for each of the panels just to share, I guess, what your outlook for tokenization, and in particular in Asia, when do you think we will start to see more broad-based adoption of, of tokenization? Um, well, I'm very supportive of blockchain, so. Uh, I'm biased as well. So, so in a way, um, from last year onwards, we're seeing a lot of um, actual applications from banks being rolled out with blockchain. Well, it's not crypto related, it's not token related. Uh, it is token related in a certain sense. But then again, um, hopefully, uh, I would want to see, or I'm speculating and thinking about that, there's, there's going to be more and more banks that's going to roll out more applications in real life, and there's going to be more and more uh, other non-banks or financial um, tokens related blockchain applications being rolled out. Uh, and so people will know that, oh, at, at the very least, what blockchain is really is, and then from there on, the, the adoption rate could push a little bit more further, push the consumers a little bit more forward. Uh, and hopefully people will start talking a little bit more, the regulators will be talking a little bit more about SDOs and everything, so. I'd say over the next two years, we're gonna see a lot more private, larger style deals that are done in, with blockchain security tokens. Uh, and then over the next kind of two to five years, we'll see those being listed on exchanges. Um, that's after we've actually seen some trading and liquidity on OTC markets and I'd say the market is probably going to trickle down the ballot from there. Um, from our side, I mean, we, we're, we're excited, I think, to see more developments in the uh, tokenization of securities. Um, some firms have tried to do it, for example, you know, tokenizing uh, US equities, uh, index funds, etc., uh, because they're not exactly accessible to the rest of the world or anyone. Um, and so 
Uh, we are seeing a lot of companies that are focusing on that. We see that as quite an easy application uh, for the market. Uh, more broadly speaking, um, in the utility world, uh, we'd love to see more adoption and you know decentralized applications, etc. However, that's even been slow. Um, you know, so our outlook for security tokens—it's it's a really hard question. Um, you know, when is liquidity going to come in? Um, when is retail going to get really excited about it? When is there going to be institutional participation? Um, at this point in time, we we don't have the answer to it. I can tell you that there is a lot of progress being made. Um, however, I think it's sort of baby steps right now. Um, so before we wrap up, does anyone from the 